What's going on everybody? Estas here. Welcome back to another video. So today I have a good one for you guys. I have a good one. We're going to be doing a stock market for beginners in 2022 video going over everything that you need to know as a beginner in the stock market to actually get your feet wet, get involved and understand or at least have a basic understanding of what the heck is going on. And trust me, guys, I put a lot of work into this, prepping it, planning it, putting it together. You will find value. I guarantee you will find value in this video. So before we actually dive into it, let's talk about myself very briefly. For all of you guys that are new to my channel, well, if you've been watching my channel, you know this, but for all my new viewers out there, hopefully this does get pushed to a wide audience. My name is Stas. I've been making YouTube videos on the stock market for about four, going on five years, and I've actually been trading, investing full time during that time period as well. I actually haven't had a job since 2007. So five years since my last job, I've been doing this full time and I've been educated in finance, business. I've been doing this in total for about eight years at this point. So I have a pretty good understanding. I'm not trying to toot my own horn or say, oh, I'm Warren Buffett or this or that. Charlie Munger, the best investor. I'm not nowhere near close to to the best investor, but I do have a pretty good understanding of how things work and I do want to break it down for you in this video. So let's get into it. So we're going to be talking about a lot of things. Number one, we're going to talk about what a stock is. Then we're going to get into what the stock market as a whole is, why you should be investing in stocks. We're also going to go into the stock market's performance historically, and we're going to break down the different categories slash sectors of stocks. We're going to go over brokerages, which ones I like, which ones I don't like so much. And we're going to break down individual stocks, index funds, ETFs, mutual funds. We'll break down the difference between gambling, which a lot of people are gambling in the markets these days, in the stock market, crypto market. We're going to break down gambling versus investing. And I want to go over different stock market strategies, retirement accounts, basic terms that you need to know when it comes down to the stock market. And we're going to go over different order types, valuation metrics, the financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows. We're going to talk about growth versus value. And we're going to break down tech technical analysis. We'll go over charting, the very basics of that, and how to find winning stocks. And of course, everybody's favorite. Just kidding. We all hate this, but we have to pay them. We're going to break down taxes as well. And with that being said, guys, let's start the video. So what's a stock? What is a stock? I know a lot of you guys have probably been dabbling in the stock market or you want to. You've heard a lot about it over the past year or two, and you're probably thinking to yourself, what is a stock? Well, a stock is a small piece of a publicly traded company, right? You guys use products every day, right? I have an iPhone right here. I have my AirPods right here. A lot of the time, these products that you use every day are owned or created rather by publicly traded companies, companies that you and me, pretty much anybody out there that's over a certain age, or even if you're under 18, you can get a, a custodial account. We're not going to go into that at this point, but we can buy stock in these publicly traded companies that produce products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, heck, I'm using an Apple laptop when I'm making this video. So if you buy a stock, essentially what you're doing is you're buying a small piece of a company. You are now a owner of a company, right? Stocks allow you to own equity in a business, just like when you're buying, let's say a house and you have a mortgage and you're paying off your mortgage, you have equity in your home. View it the same way, but it's not exactly the same thing. But you, when you're buying stock, you own equity. You have equity in that business, which means you are entitled to a certain amount of the profits that that business makes. So let's say, for example, Apple makes $100 billion 
of profit, right? Let's just use Apple for an example because I guarantee you, you're probably watching this on an Apple device or most of you guys are, maybe not all of you. Let's say you like Microsoft or whatever you use their products, but Microsoft's a great example as well. If they make money, Microsoft, Apple, any publicly traded company, right? You are entitled to a certain amount of of that money, that profit, of course, depending on how many shares you own. Let's say, for example, you own one share of Apple. $180 is what Apple's trading for right now per share. You're entitled to a very teeny tiny piece of the pie. Let's say, for example, Apple makes about $5 per share in EPS, right? We'll get more into this stuff later in the video. You are entitled to that. You make money by simply owning stock in a publicly traded company. And by buying stocks, you essentially are a direct owner of the best companies in the world. So let's say you use Amazon every day, you use Apple like we just talked about, maybe Microsoft, and you buy stock in these companies, you own these companies. It's pretty cool, right? You can literally have direct ownership in these businesses, right? By buying their stock. So that's essentially what a stock is. Now let's talk about what the stock market is. What's the stock market? Well, the stock market broadly refers to the collection of exchanges and other venues where the buying, selling, and issuance of shares of publicly held companies take place. So a stock is the small piece of a company that you can buy. The stock market is essentially where you buy these stocks. This is where you buy the stocks, hence why it's called stock market. Like supermarket is where you go and you buy your groceries, right? Stock market is where you go and buy your stocks. There's different exchanges that include, in the United States at least, the New York Stock Exchange. You guys have probably heard this, the NYSE. And you also have the NASDAQ. This is where you go and you buy stocks. And some foreign exchanges include the Tokyo Stock Exchange, the TSE, the London Stock Exchange, the LSE, and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, and of course, there's many more. And that is where you can go and buy foreign stocks, which we're not really going to talk much about, uh, about those in this video. But overall, what you guys need to know is the stock market, again, I can't say it enough, is where you go to actually buy the stocks. The stocks are, again, the small slices, pieces, whatever you want to call it, of publicly traded companies. So why the heck should you even invest in stocks? Is it because you want to look cool at a party or because you want to be like, oh, I own Apple. It's it's pretty cool, right? Um, not necessarily. I mean, yes, you can talk about it at parties or do whatever you want and, and brag about it. But why you should invest in stocks, the reason why you want to do this is because, well, there's many reasons. But the two main ones are, number one, inflation. You guys have heard inflation. This is what eats away your purchasing power. So let's say you have $100 in cash, right? You have a $100 bill. Each year that goes by, that $100, it becomes less. The next year, it's going to be 98. The next year, it's going to be 94 or whatever, depending on the rate of inflation. Typically, inflation is around 2 to 3% a year. And this year, in 2021 and in 2022, it's a lot higher. It's sitting at about 6 7%. And that's an even bigger reason to invest in stocks, meaning that $100 that you have is going to be $93, $92, $94 in the, uh, in the next year. And each year it's going to get diminished more and more and more to the point where it's essentially going to be worthless if you hold dollars in cash for 10, 15, 20 years. It's literally going to go down in value. So the reason why you need to invest in stocks, and by the way, I'm not a financial advisor, do your own due diligence. I'm not telling you what stocks to buy or what to do, but you guys have to understand if you keep your money in cash over time, you're not going to go anywhere. That's why people say savers are losers. There's a reason why that's a saying. So the Fed eats, or rather the Fed targets around 
2% a year for inflation. Right now, it's a lot higher than that. And if you invest in stocks, stocks typically return 8 to 10, 12, maybe 15%. It varies every year. But if you're investing in stocks, you're making, let's say, 10%, you are beating inflation. So let's say you have $100 one year, you invest, you make 10%. You have $110 now, then $121 the next year if you keep getting 10%, if my math's even right on that. But you get the point, right? You're going to be ahead of inflation if you invest in stocks and real estate and other assets for that matter, but we're not going to be getting into those in this video. So yes, inflation is number one. That is why you must invest in stocks. But again, I'm not telling you guys what to do because I'm not a financial advisor. And number two is because of ownership. If you look at the richest people in the world, they didn't get rich by just saving money. Like I said, cash is essentially trash. If you save money 10, 20 years from now, that money is going to be a lot less, worth a lot less. So if you own businesses long term by buying their stocks and you have ownership and strong businesses, and we will get deeper into this later in the video, you are going to be in a very good spot. Your net worth, your money, your nest egg, whatever you want to call it, your pile of cash in these businesses, if you pick good businesses, that is, this is going to do um, or increase your net worth over time. Imagine if you bought Apple 10 years ago, Apple stock, Amazon stock 10 years ago, your wealth will grow as that business grows. And it's pretty passive. Let's say you own or, or rather you um, have a job. Let's say you're working a job, you're making a hundred grand a year and you put in 20 grand a year into the stock market every single year, that's going to compound. And while you're working, your money's working for you as well in your stock account. And like I said, your, um, your nest egg, your net worth is growing as the markets, as the businesses you pick grow. So that's why you want to invest to stay ahead of inflation and because you're owning strong businesses that will grow your wealth over time. And of course, there's way more reasons to invest, but those are two of the most important. Now let's take a look at stock market returns. And no, we're not going to get political here because I do have a chart showing you guys, um, you know, Republican presidents, Democrat presidents, how the markets have performed under both parties. Um, and I'm not going to get political, obviously. That's not the point of this video, but I want to show you guys over the past, what is this, 100 years pretty much, we have grown, the stock market has grown under every single president. Well, maybe not during the term of each president, but over time, well, now that I'm looking at it, it seems like it has grown uh, with each president. But overall, over time, what you guys need to know is the stock market has averaged about 10% per year for nearly the last century. And like we mentioned in the previous slide, inflation reduces this return by an average of 2 to 3% per year. In some years, inflation is running a lot hotter like it is this year and probably um, in this year, but I mean 2021 and probably in 2022. And other years, it runs lower, sometimes even deflation. So you guys can see here, you know, Coolidge, uh, we had a big pop you know, when Coolidge was president, then we had a little bit of a drop with Hoover and then Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, throughout all these presidencies, whether it's Democrat, Republican, markets have gone very well, which kind of goes off, piggyba uh, piggybacks off my point from the last slide, where if you just literally passively invest, you have your job, you run businesses, you throw money in the markets, passively, the money is going to do the work for you. It is going to grow. And then you're going to look at your account one day, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, and you're going to have a lot more money than you would have if you simply just saved that money. So 10% per year is what the stock market has done on average over the past almost century at this point in time. And let's see what we got on the next slide here. Stock categories. This is very important. When you're looking at stocks, you don't just have a bunch of massive companies. In fact, there's a lot of small companies. We have large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small caps. And there's probably another category I should have put here, uh, micro caps, but those kind of go in uh, hand in hand with the uh, small caps here. We have large caps that are corporations with a market cap, meaning the, the whole business is valued over $10 billion. And we will talk more about market 
market cap later in this video. And these are typically the large cap stocks, more established, and sometimes they pay dividends, which we'll also talk about what a dividend is later in this video. But, um, you know, in, in short, a dividend is simply a payment from earnings, the earnings of a company that a company decides to pay to shareholders, right? And, and again, we'll talk more about that later in this video. Then we have mid cap stocks. These are corporations with a market cap between two and $10 billion. And they're more growth oriented because when you're a small company, guys, even a mid cap company, um, you're focusing a lot on growth. You want to become a big, a large cap company, 10 plus billion dollar company. And you notice when companies are very large, their growth kind of slows down because there's only so much you can grow, um, you know, when, when you're already a massive company. I mean, look at businesses like Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble or businesses like Disney. You know, there's only so much these huge companies can grow. Uh, but when you're already a, or when you're a small company, mid cap company, there's a lot of room to grow that that's, you know, the big key difference there. So mid cap companies, they're two to 10 billion in market cap, and they're more growth oriented. And when it comes to small cap stocks, small cap companies, these are corporations with a market cap between 300 million to $2 billion. So we're talking pretty small. $300 million. I mean, that's a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to stock market, publicly traded companies, 300 million is chump change. And these are higher risk, higher uh, reward companies. To just put this into perspective, um, each company that you guys use every day, again, like I mentioned, iPhone, we got the uh, AirPods right here. These started off small. These companies were small, some smaller than others. And if you invested in them back in the day when they were just starting out, they were small. There's a ridiculous amount of risk because there's a huge risk. They can go bankrupt, but there's also a huge reward because if they do become that next home run company, they end up doing very well. You're going to be filthy rich if you invest when they're very small. So remember this, small cap companies, they're small in size. There's high risk with them, but there's also extremely high reward. Keep that in mind. So let's talk a little bit about the different stock market sectors. You guys have probably heard about these, maybe not. And if you haven't, you're in luck. We're going to be talking about them in this video. So as of now, the 11 stock market sectors are energy, materials, industrials. We have utilities. We have healthcare. We have financials consumer discretionary, consumer staples, information technology, consumer uh, or rather communication services, and we have real estate. And now with the rise of cryptocurrency, there's a lot of debate on whether or not that's going to be the 12th stock market sector, which honestly, it probably will end up being the 12th. I mean, you guys can see there is a missing one down here. So crypto is probably going to end up being that 12th one. And these are essentially just the different categories of companies, right? You have the energy companies, the oil companies. These are energy stocks. Think of Exxon, Chevron. Think of, you know, BP, uh, those type of companies. You have materials. You have industrials. Think about Caterpillar, Honeywell, Big Machinery, you know, Lockheed. Martin. You have utilities. Think of the different um, boring utility companies out there that would fall in this category. You have healthcare, Johnson and Johnson, United Health. Um, what, what, what are some other ones? Uh, AbbVie. These are a couple of healthcare companies. We have financials. These include banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. You have consumer discretionary, consumer staples, which include you know staples that you need in your everyday life. Think of about uh, Procter and Gamble products, Colgate, Palmolive. Think about Clorox, you know, cleaning products, toothpaste, you know, um, well, what are some other ones? Bounty, you know, paper towels, things like that. Those are consumer staples. Information technology, you have tech products or companies um, like Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA. I guess that would fall in that category. Con uh, communication services, you have AT&T, Verizon, and of course, you have real estate. There's different 
REITs, they're called, real estate investment trusts, where essentially you can buy these real estate investment trusts that those trusts, the real estate investment trusts, they own real estate, they manage the real estate, they do all the work with the real estate, and you can just buy one of these like a publicly traded stock, and you essentially have a piece of that real estate, right, if that makes any sense. So those are the 11 stock market sectors, and please guys, if you have any questions throughout the course of this video, please drop me a comment down below. Make sure to hit the like button as well if you guys are finding value in this video. Make sure to share it with a friend. If you know anybody that's looking to get started in the stock market, this is going to be a great video for them. So those are the 11 stock market sectors. Let's keep it on going, guys. Let's keep on going. Brokerages. Let's talk a little bit about brokerages here. And I do have experience with pretty much all of the ones that are shown here on the screen right now. We have Fidelity. We have TD Ameritrade. We have Robinhood. We have E-Trade. We have Charles Schwab, Vanguard, and M1 Finance. So some of these are legacy brokerages, which have been around for a very long time. And some of these have only been around for five to 10 years. And I'm not sure what those are called. We have legacy. And I guess you can just say new age brokerages that came along with the uh, smartphone. They started off as apps and then they just developed from there and, uh, you know, continued to advance. And, you know, the, the legacy ones include Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, Charles Schwab, and Vanguard. And some of those, they don't have the best interfaces. You know, UI, user interface. Uh, Vanguard, not the best. Charles Schwab, and eh, not the best. E-Trade's a little bit better. TD, solid. Uh, but Fidelity's great. I actually personally use Fidelity. It's a legacy brokerage, like I said. And they have a great user inter uh, interface. I've been with them for pretty much the entirety of my uh, stock market career. Those are are, or Fidelity is my main brokerage. I love them. Uh, when it comes to the new age brokerages, you have Robinhood, you have M1 Finance, which I do have extensive experience with M1 Finance. That's more of a long-term buy and hold type of brokerage. They have trading windows, which means you could only trade two times a day, once at 9.30 uh, in the morning on the East Coast time. And then at uh, in the afternoon, I think it's at about 3, maybe 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. on the East Coast. So that's more of a long-term brokerage. M1 Finances, and I guess you can call it a robo-advisor. If you want to, you know, throw in money and then have it automatically pull money out of your account, you can actually, your bank account that is, you can actually have it automatically invest in your holdings, which I do have an M1 Finance playlist. I have a whole portfolio on M1 Finance that you guys can check out if you want to. Go to my YouTube channel, check out the playlist, and you can see how that uh, brokerage works. So I like M1 Finance for more long-term investing. And Fidelity, like I said, is my main brokerage. That's good for anything. Long-term investments, retirement accounts, trading, options, whatever you want, you can do on Fidelity. And Robinhood, of course, you can do that as well. It's uh, kind of gamified investing, trading. You could do options on there. You can do a bunch of things. So overall, these all serve their purposes, right? Fidelity is great if you want a more traditional legacy, more trustable brokerage. Not saying that the other ones are not trustable, but if you want one that's been around, it's more established, Fidelity is great. Robinhood's great for the uh, user interface. More, it's just way easier to use. And M1 Finance is also pretty easy to use. These are great. And then if you want a more um, boring legacy brokerage that doesn't really work that well, I'm not saying it doesn't work that well, but it's not the best user experience. You could probably go Vanguard, Charles Schwab, maybe TD Ameritrade. Um, you know, those are just a couple of brokerages that I've had experience with. And for sure, my favorite one's Fidelity, followed by. Um, M1 Finance. That's just me. So now that we broke down stocks, the stock market, different sectors, the returns over time, plus more, let's talk a little bit more about individual stocks. Then we're going to break down what an ETF is, exchange traded fund. We're going to break down mutual funds, index funds. So get ready, guys. We're about to have some fun. So individual stocks. We kind of talked a little bit about this in the beginning of the video where I gave the Apple Microsoft example. Um, essentially, individual stocks are stocks um, that are publicly traded, obviously, or shares of publicly traded companies 
on the stock market. So let's say you want to own Microsoft directly, Apple directly. You don't want any other holdings, right? We'll talk more about this in a second. If you want to own one company, you go and buy stock in that one company because with ETFs, you own a basket of stocks. You don't really have a say of what is in that ETF, what's in that basket. But if you pick an individual stock, you do have a say. You have a say in what stock you want to own. You can actually cherry pick which stocks you want. So for example, I want to own Apple. I go buy Apple stock. I want to own Google. I go buy Google stock. That is what an individual stock is. And if you own only one or a couple of individual stocks, you won't be as diversified as somebody that owned many individual stocks, let's say 30 stocks, or somebody that just owned an ETF or mutual fund, which again, ETFs, mutual funds, they are a little bit different, but those are essentially baskets of stocks. So you're extremely diversified if you own ETFs or mutual funds. So individual stocks offer more reward, but there's more risk involved because you have all your eggs essentially in one basket. So let's say you bought one stock and that's all you own. You're pretty much riding or dying with that stock. But if you own an ETF, a basket of stocks, you have one stock in there or many stocks in there, some of which are going to do well, some of which aren't going to do well. And overall, you're going to get an average return because all of those are going to average out, right? But if you only have one stock, it could do very well one year and you're crushing it. You're on your high horse one year and then next year, hey, it might not do as well. It might crash and then you're uh, you're you're crying yourself to sleep every night. So understand with individual stocks, there's more reward, but there's also more risk involved and individual stocks allow you to handpick your portfolio and own what you truly understand as opposed to ETFs and mutual funds. And we kind of already covered this um, as opposed to ETFs and mutual funds that might own stocks that you don't want to have ownership in. Because again, if you buy an ETF, the ETF might own stocks that you like, but it might also have, let's say, tobacco stocks or um, healthcare stocks that you don't want to be a part of. That is the downside of ETF. So now that we talked about individual stocks, let's keep on pushing, guys. Let's talk about index funds. Index funds are the best way for you and I, if we want to passively get rich over time, Index funds are the way to go, right? An index fund is a type of mutual fund or ETF with a portfolio constructed to match or track the components of a financial market index such as the S&P 500. So you guys have probably heard about the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100. These are all indexes. The S&P 500 is comprised of the five hundred largest publicly traded companies in the United States of America. So if I buy an S&P 500 ETF like ticker symbol VOO um, or SPY, I essentially own the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States. That is what that means. And like we mentioned in the previous slide, you might own companies you want to own. You might own companies that you don't want to be a part of. But overall, if you own an ETF like that, that tracks the S&P 500, you are extremely diversified. You have a lot of holdings and you're going to match the market return every single year. You're pretty much going to average whatever the market's average every single year. And index funds are generally considered ideal core portfolio holdings for retirement accounts, such as individual retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, and we'll talk more about these later in the video. But I guarantee guarantee you guys, if you're investing for retirement, you have a 401k, a Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, 403b, whatever, you are invested in mutual funds, ETFs that track the overall markets. It's that simple. Um, that's what you're investing in. When you're putting money every week, every month, bi-weekly, whatever, that is what you're investing in most likely. Um, you know, funds that track the S&P, the Dow, NASDAQ, that is how it works. That is just how it works. So if you want broad diversification, you want to set it and forget it, you want to invest like a boring old man, which is actually a great way to invest passively, um, just buy 
an index fund. It's that simple. And that's all you have to do, guys. It is that simple. Buy an index fund, add to it every month, buy weekly, weekly, it doesn't matter. And 30, 40 years down the line, you are going to be very happy. Let's just put it that way. Because again, like we mentioned earlier in this video, the average return is 10% per year for the stock market, which is great. So let's talk about ETFs, also known as exchange traded funds. An ETF is a type of security that tracks an index, a sector, a commodity, or any other asset, but which can be purchased or sold on a stock exchange the same way a regular stock can. And that's actually the main difference between an ETF and a mutual fund. I believe mutual funds are priced at the end of the day. That's when they're added. But an ETF, like I just read to you guys, you can buy this once the market opens, pre-market, aftermarket, anytime throughout the day, you can buy an ETF, which is why I personally prefer ETFs all day over mutual funds and we'll talk more about that in a second here some of the most popular etfs that track the s p 500 include spy and voo which we covered just a couple of minutes ago and these have very low expense ratios some as low as 0.03 percent and i've actually seen some as high as 0.5 percent so let's talk about this a little bit expense ratios you guys must you must listen to me you must know what an expense ratio is. So important because this is what you have to pay for the ETF or the mutual fund to actually be managed. So let's say, for example, you have $1,000. Let's use 1000 for round numbers. And you buy an ETF that pays or that requires you to pay a 0.03% expense ratio. For $1,000, you're going to be paying $0.30 cents a year for essentially that ETF to be uh, managed. For you to hold that ETF, you have to pay the owner or you know the creator of the ETF um, 30 cents per year, which is very small. 0.03% is extremely tiny. And let's say you have to pay half a percent, that's a little bit more. You're going to be paying $5 for $1,000. So if you have $1,000 invested with a half a percent expense ratio, you're going to be paying five dollars so you guys have to understand expense ratios are very important because people neglect these let's say they see a fund they just buy the fund and then they're in, they're going to be paying sometimes upwards of two percent could you imagine paying two percent so let's say you have a hundred or a thousand dollars you're paying 20 bucks a year in expense ratio. That's a lot, guys. I'm telling you, that's a lot. Long term, that the the expense ratio you're paying, a very high expense ratio, that is going to add up to hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars sometimes um, that you could have saved if you paid a very or picked a fund that had a very low expense ratio. So you have to be cognizant of what you're paying um, when it comes to these expense ratios. I cannot hammer that point in enough. And the price of an ETF, like we kind of mentioned already, this fluctuates all day and you can buy them throughout the market hours, pre-market, aftermarket, which is very different from uh, mutual funds. So hope you guys got a quick understanding there of what an ETF is. This is essentially the easiest way to invest in the stock market, right? Just buy an ETF of the S&P 500, set it and forget it, and you're ready to go. So that is what an ETF is. Now let's move on and talk about a mutual fund. So a mutual fund is a type of investment vehicle consisting of a portfolio of stocks, bonds, or other securities. Mutual funds are operated by professional money managers who allocate the fund's assets and attempt to produce capital gains or income for the fund's investors. Mutual funds charge expense ratios every year and sometimes commissions, guys, so be careful. And these expense ratios from uh, mutual funds like we covered in the ETF slide, these eat into your long-term gains. So mutual funds, these are more actively managed where ETFs are more passively managed or uh, passive um, investments because they literally just track an index, an S&P 500 index. It's that simple. Where mutual funds, you have professional money managers where there's a lot of stats that most of these underperform the market, right? You have these money managers that are picking individual stocks, trying to beat 
the market. They're trying to outperform the market. And again, like I said, a lot of the time they don't. And you're paying a premium to these people, these professionals for uh, managing your money, where in my opinion, it would have been a lot better for you to just buy an ETF and uh, set it and forget it and let the market do the work as opposed to, you know, these professional money managers trying um, to beat the market. So sometimes I've seen this, believe me, guys, um, you know, expense ratios for mutual funds are around 1.5 to 2%, which is insane. I mean, long term, um, you're going to be putting a lot of money or giving away a lot of your hard earned money to these people for uh, managing your, um, you know, mutual funds. And they're going to underperform a lot of the time. That's the crazy part about it. So in my opinion, ETFs are way better than mutual funds. And the crazy thing is the overwhelming majority of money in employer-sponsored retirement plans goes into mutual funds. That is the scary thing, guys. You know, if you're, you know, if you're invested with your job, 401k, do a little bit of research. Dig into what they're putting your money into. You know, look into this stuff because I'm telling you, you're probably paying a lot of money that if you just kept and you kept investing it in a low expense ratio fund like an ETF like VOO or SPY, you'd be a lot better off long term. You would have a lot more money for yourself, your family, future generations, and that's just the way to go in my opinion. Alrighty guys, let's get into the good stuff now. Let's break down some strategies that I use and a lot of people out there use all the time to make money in the stock market. Number one, we have long-term investing. Number two, we have swing trading. Number three, Three, we have day trading and then we have options trading, which a lot of people have been getting into options recently and they are risky. We will break those down in a couple of minutes here. And then after options trading, we have short selling. And what you guys have to understand is all of these are are extremely different. They're used in different time periods, different market conditions, and we will break that down as well in this video. So number one, long-term investing, right? This is very simple. You buy, you hold. Pretty much if you've bought in 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago in the stock market and you held all the way till today, you are going to be very well off. So long-term investing is simply buying, holding, continuously buying, holding, and pretty much just holding for 5, 10, 20, 30 plus years. That's the most basic way people make money in the stock market, long-term investing. Now, the next one, swing trading, day trading, we'll lump these together. These are not, I guess, investing strategies. They're more trading strategy. They are short term in nature. So the idea here is to buy a stock with swing trading. You buy a stock, you hold it for a couple of days, and hopefully you make a profit. You sell, you pay the short term capital gains tax, which we will break down taxes at the end of this video. And that's swing trading. Pretty much you hold for more than one day. And let's say a swing trade could be a couple weeks, a couple months. It's, uh, it's no more than one year. You know, that's swing trading. Day trading is you get in and out in the same day. So, for example, if I buy Apple today, I day trade it, meaning I buy it today at 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. rather on the East Coast and sell it at 2 p.m. for a profit, that is a day trade. And these heavily rely, you know, swing trading and day trading. These strategies rely heavily on charting, technical analysis, short-term news, momentum. That is what you're working with. And this is more for the advanced, intermediate to advanced stock market person. I mean, if you're just a beginner, I wouldn't really focus on swing and day trading quite yet. Now, options trading, this is even more advanced. You have to be, I don't want to say if you're a beginner, you can't look at options trading because that's not true. You want to learn as much as you can as a beginner. Um, but options trading, I would personally want for you guys and me personally, this is what I did to get more experience with how the stock market works, how individual stocks, ETFs and mutual funds work first before starting to dabble into options, you know, build a base, build a base, a foundation and then start getting into options trading. And we'll talk more about options trading here in a little bit, but essentially you could sell options, which is way less risky than buying options. Let's say you're buying options. You want to buy a call. That means you believe a stock is going to go up by a certain 
uh, period of time or by a certain date, and you think it's going to go up to a certain price. You would buy a call option if that is what you believe. If you want the stock to go down or you believe the stock is going to go down, you would buy a put option. And again, we'll talk about that here in a couple of minutes. Then we have short selling, which short selling is a very dangerous game as well, where you essentially borrow shares from a brokerage. You sell them to the open market. So you buy these or uh, borrow these shares from your brokerage on margin. You sell them on the open market and then you want the stock to go down. So when you sell them on the open market, you want the stock to go down, then you have to buy back those shares to return them to your brokerage, right? That is how you make money. You make the spread. You borrow the shares, you sell them to the open market, you get that cash, and then you rebuy the shares at a lower price, you return them to the brokerage, and you keep that spread. That is how short selling works. It's complicated. Not really though. I mean, once you get your um, you know, basic understanding of it, but it's it, it gets a little bit wonky. So be careful with short selling. Now, before we actually dive deeper into these strategies, let's talk a little bit about gambling versus investing. This is a very big topic because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm buying this penny stock. I'm investing in this penny stock. Oh, I'm buying this cryptocurrency. I'm you know, investing in it. And it's an altcoin that's worth $100 million or $10 million. The truth is, guys, a lot of people these days are confusing gambling and speculating with investing. So if you're gambling or speculating, you are putting money into something that has essentially no underlying value. It's not really doing anything in terms of producing a profit. It might be a pre-revenue company. It might be some worthless NFT or worthless cryptocurrency. This is gambling speculating. You are also overpaying. Let's say, for example, you are overpaying greatly for something in hopes it's going to continue going up in price. That is gambling and speculating. So I don't want to pick on uh, a particular overvalued stock, but let's say, for example, um, what's a very overvalued stock that people always bag on? Um, Tesla. I don't want to get I don't want to get all you Tesla people out there. In fact, I own Tesla at a much lower price, but let's say you bought Tesla at $1,200 a share, which recently when I'm filming this video, it peaked at $1,250. So if you're buying it at an extraordinarily overvalued price, $1,250 a share, and you think it's going to go to $1,500 next week, that's gambling, that's speculating, that is not investing. And when you're gambling and speculating, there's essentially no fundamental backing in your investment decisions. It's pretty much hype oriented. So if you're dealing, uh, dealing with something uh, purely with hype, you know, there's, there's strictly hype, there's no value, there's no profit, it's overvalued, you know, the, the price is ridiculous. This is gambling, or not gambling, I just, you know, put those words together. <laughs> that was pretty good, right, guys? Gambling and speculating, right? Gambling. We're going to make that a new word. And investing on the flip side is you're putting your money in a business that there's a strong moat, there's a huge competitive advantage, it's not extremely overvalued, there are strong fundamentals, backing the company. They have a lot of cash, plant and equipment. They have patents. You know, they have products that people use every day and there's no there's no way that these products are going to become, you know, obsolete, you know, like the iPhone, Apple. Sure, there's probably going to be a disruptor of the iPhone that's that could be coming soon, but as of now, Apple's competitive advantage is ridiculous. Their moat is very strong. Same with Google, you know, YouTube. You're watching this on YouTube. Google search engine Google has become a verb at this point. Oh, I'm Googling this, Googling that. I'm going on YouTube, the best video platform by far. You're searching on YouTube. You know, these are companies that have a huge moat, huge competitive advantage. Their fundamentals are very strong and they're profitable. And if you're investing in, in companies that maybe aren't profitable, that's not necessarily a gamble or speculation, but you have to see that these companies have a clear path to profitability. You know, like companies that, again, maybe aren't making profits now, if they have a clear path to profitability in, in a quarter, two quarters, a year, two years, 
that is a very, very good sign. So that is the key difference between gambling and investing. Now, let's take a look at growth versus value. This is very important as well because when we're looking at stocks, we have growth stocks, we have value stocks, we have dividend stocks. There, there's a lot of different categories, but in, in this part of the video, we're going to focus on uh, growth versus value. So growth companies are companies that are growing their revenues year after year, quarter after quarter by a, a good chunk. We're talking not one, two percent a year. That's not really a growth company, but a company that's growing, let's say 15, 20, 25, 30, 50, 100 percent revenue year over year, quarter over quarter. That is a growth company. They're growing heavily and they're not necessarily focused on maximizing profits quite yet because they're trying to grow the top line of the business. In other words, they're trying to grow their revenues. And then once the growth slows down over the next couple of years, because growth, it's not going to grow forever. I mean, there's going to be a time where growth slows. And then once growth does slow or even before growth starts to slow, they're slowly starting to focus on profit at that point too right? So they typically trade at higher multiples, growth stocks do, since they are growing faster than the average company. And by higher multiples, we'll talk more about this later in the video, higher multiples essentially means it's trading at growth companies trade at higher valuations. So essentially, you have to pay a premium to own these growth companies because they're growing so heavily. You have to pay top dollar to be involved with stocks that are growing quite heavily or quite nicely over time. That is essentially what higher multiples, trading at higher multiples means. I mean, look at Tesla, look at companies like NVIDIA, AMD. These are companies that have extraordinary growth and they're trading at very high valuations, very high multiples. And growth stocks are usually more volatile and risky than the overall market. They are more uh, volatile than the S&P 500, for example. Tesla, <laughs> trust me, it is way more volatile than the S&P 500. NVIDIA is, AMD, and most growth stocks out there are. And a vast majority of growth companies don't pay a dividend since they can use that cash to grow the business instead. So this is very important. This is a key um, differentiating factor between growth companies and value companies. So if you're growing your business, like we talked about, 20, 30, 100% a year, you are not going to want to take cash out of that business and pay it to a shareholder in the form of dividends because you are going to want to, instead of taking that money and paying a dividend, you're going to want to reinvest it in the business to try and grow it even further. And when a company matures, remember, like I said, growth, it doesn't, it's not forever. I mean, it's going to slow down eventually. When companies mature, growth starts to slow down. That is when they start paying a dividend. I mean, look at Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble. We talked about these earlier in the video. Look at companies that are not are barely growing anymore. They're growing 1%, 2 3% a year. Coca-Cola, Pepsi are great examples. They pay dividends because they rather give money back to shareholders in a form of a dividend as opposed to taking that money and trying to grow the business because there's not much growth left. I mean, they can only grow one, two, three percent a year, so they might as well just pay a dividend. So keep that in mind. Growth companies barely pay dividends ever. Sometimes they do, but when they do, it's it's a small, teeny tiny dividend. And when it comes to value stocks, these stocks are trading a lot under or far under their intrinsic value. And the popular used valuation metrics such as price to earnings, price to book, and a bunch of other ones. So value companies, essentially, you are paying 50 cents on the dollar for these companies. So remember, growth, they trade at a premium. They trade above what the market is uh, valued at. Let's say the S&P 500's price to earnings ratio is a 25 some of these growth companies, you're paying us 50, a 75, 100 price to earnings. So you're paying a premium, but with value stocks, you are paying under what the market is trading at. So you're essentially getting a company, a stock at a cheaper price. That is what you have to think when you think value. I mean, think about it. When you go to a store, there's a sale. You go buy some clothes. They're 30% off. That is a value. You're buying your clothes for cheap. 
cheaper than what they were. That is the same thing with the stock market, right? These stocks are typically out of the spotlight. Let's say they for they're forgotten. They're not these hype stocks that everybody talks about. For example, these days, at least when I'm filming this video, Intel is one of these stocks that's undervalued. Nobody talks about Intel. Activision Blizzard is undervalued. Nobody really talks about it. It's kind of in the gutter right now. Um, Smith & Wesson is another one that's undervalued. And the list goes on. And, and the thing is, these are harder to find than the growth stocks that are trading at a very high multiple. It's actually very difficult to find stocks that are value stocks. And that is why value investors, they're not investing every week, every month. They're very picky with their investments because, you know, they could be tracking a lot of stocks, but a lot of them are overvalued. And then they're tracking them. And then once they get undervalued, that is when they strike. It's kind of like a snake or um, what is it? A python. It strikes at the right time, right? Look at my hand here, guys. Boom. That is my... uh. You know, uh, well, that's kind of what a, a snake looks like, right? It strikes at you, and that's what value investors do. They wait, they're patient. When the stock hits the price, boom, they uh, they strike. And these stocks, value stocks, are less volatile and sometimes, a lot of the time, less risky than the overall market because they're so freaking cheap. And one thing worth mentioning here is just because a stock is very cheap doesn't mean it's always a buy. There's value traps out there. There's stocks that are trading very cheap for a reason and they might get even cheaper. In fact, they might go bankrupt. So keep that in mind. Be very careful about that. And many value stocks pay dividends since they can't use that cash to stimulate growth within the business. Like I already talked about um, two minutes ago, you know, growth companies, they don't pay dividends because they could reinvest that money and grow the business. But value companies, they're not growing that much, so they might as well pay a dividend to the shareholders to make them happy. That is how it works, guys. So now let's talk a little bit about the most popular strategy out there that pretty much everybody that invests through, let's say, their job, their 401k, let's say they started a Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, 403b, whatever, a taxable brokerage as well. What most people do is long-term investing, the uh, the infamous buy and hold strategy. You guys have heard about that. So buy and hold, this is the most common strategy used amongst stock market participants, people that invest with a 5, 10 plus year horizon, 20, 30, 50 plus year horizon. Those are long-term investors. And like I said, people typically use this strategy with their 401ks, Roth IRAs, and other retirement vehicles. And simply put, guys, long-term investing is a buy and hold strategy. So let's say, like we talked about earlier, ETFs, the S&P 500 ETF that I personally own is the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF, uh, ticker symbol VOO. If I buy this year after year, I just invest a certain amount each month and I hold on to it, I'm considered a long-term investor. It's that simple. If I buy Apple stock or any other stock for that matter and I hold it 5, 10, 15 years, that is long-term investing. So there's no need to really complicate this. That is all it is. Buy, hold, buy stocks that are good values, hold them for a long-term uh, long term time horizon, buy ETFs, mutual funds, hold them long-term. That is what long-term investing is. Pretty simple, right guys? Pretty simple. So let's move on. Let's talk about swing and day trading. We kind of already talked about this a little bit when I first, um, you know, introduced it to you guys a couple slides ago. Uh, but swing trading and day trading, essentially, both of these rely on technical analysis, charting, you know, short term. They're they're both short term strategies in nature, and. You have a multiple holding day period for swing trading, that is. So let's say you buy a stock, you hold it for a couple of days, you sell it, that's a swing trade. You buy a stock, you hold it for a couple of weeks, that's a swing trade. You buy it, you hold it for a couple of months, that is also 
a swing trade. And I typically, me personally, and I make a lot of content on charting, day-to-day -day market activity, I like using larger time frames when doing technical analysis with swing trading. So I like using the 90-day uh, chart, the 180-day chart. I like using the yearly, the three-year chart. And sometimes I use the 20-day chart as well. So that's swing trading. You buy, you hold it for more than a day, but under a year, and then you sell it. That's simply what it is. There's heavy analysis or heavy emphasis rather on technical analysis, news, momentum, things like that. And it's pretty much the same thing with day trading. But the only difference is day trading is you buy and sell in the same day. Hence why it's called day trading, right guys? And I personally use, and most people obviously do this as well. I mean, I didn't reinvent the wheel or anything. Um, I personally use smaller time frames when doing technical analysis. So let's say I'm day trading, which I mostly swing trade when I'm doing short-term uh, stuff. But let's say I'm day trading, you know, I'm going to use the intraday chart, the one-day, one-minute chart. That shows what's going on with the stock in that day. So I'm going to be using that. I'm going to be using the five day chart, which shows the previous five days of trading. I'm going to also use the 10 day and 20 day charts as well, but mostly the intraday and the five day charts when it comes down to day trading. And full disclosure, guys, day trading is way more risky. Swing trading, it's also risky, but I think day trading is more risky than swing trading. And I personally wouldn't get involved with either of these strategies until I had that foundation built. I understand how the stock market works, you know, have a, a core core holdings, you know, an, e an ETF, some stocks, and then you can day trade around that. That is how I personally started, how I did it. And uh, that's what I recommend to you guys, even though, again, I'm not a financial advisor. Remember that. So now let's talk about options trading. Everybody's favorite, right? Options trading. So options are financial derivatives that give buyers the right but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset at an agreed upon price and date. These are heavily utilized by more intermediate and advanced investors in the stock market. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, guys, if you are a beginner, I wouldn't even mess with options trading quite yet. Get your feet wet, understand the stock market first, and then maybe do um, some options trading. So option contracts involve a buyer and a seller where the buyer pays a premium to the seller for the rights granted by the contract. And we're just talking about the basics here today, guys. So we have call options and we have put options. So let's say me, I'm a buyer of these options. I want to buy and speculate on the short term price of a stock or even the long term price. If I'm buying options that are more than a year out, those are called leaps, which we're not going to get into in this video. But overall, let's say I think Apple stock is going to go to $200 in two months from now. What I can personally do is I can go buy a call option on Apple stock. So let's say, for example, today's December 29th when I'm filming this video. Let's say by February 1st, I think Apple's going to 200. So what I can do is I can buy the $200 February 1st call options. And let's say they go to $200 and more than $2. I make a lot of money, essentially, in layman's terms. We're not going to get too deep into it, but that's how it works. But let's say they fail to get to 200 and I hold my options all throughout to expiration, I am going to lose everything. That's the risk. And let's say with call or uh, put options, I think a uh, stock is going to go down. So think call options, stocks going up. Put options, you think stocks are going to go down. So if I think Apple, let's say it's at 180 today, I think it's going to go down to $150 in three months from now, I can buy a $150 put option and make money as the stock is going down. That in layman's terms is the, the, the complete basics of calls and puts. That's buying calls and puts. So essentially, they give the buyer the right 
but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset at an agreed upon price and date. And if you're confused, don't worry. We're going to go over some terms here in a second. So the second slide I have here kind of goes into more uh, about what I just said with calls and puts. People buying these think the stock is going to go up to a certain price or even higher by a certain date. Those um, calls, right? People buying calls believe that. And these types of contracts allow the holder to buy the underlying asset at a stated price within a specific time frame. You can buy or sell these. Same with puts. You can buy puts, you can sell puts. And people buying these when it comes to puts think the stock is going to go down to a certain price or even lower by a certain date. These types of contracts allow the holder to sell the underlying asset at a stated price within a specific time period. And like I said, with calls, you can buy and sell these. With puts, you can buy and sell these. So let's get into some terms here that you guys must understand if you do want to dabble into options, with uh, which again, if you're a beginner, I'd be careful. But if you're more uh, intermediate, advanced, go ahead, go for it. You know, you're probably already trading options if you're advanced, intermediate. Um, you're most likely a beginner if you're watching this video. So beware. Strike price, strike price. This is very important. The strike price is is the price at which you can buy or sell the stock if you want to exercise the option. So remember earlier we talked about how, let's say I want Apple to go, or I think Apple, it's currently at 180, I think it's going to go to 200, and I buy the $200 call option for two months out, for example, $200 is the strike price. And when it comes to premium, the per share price that you pay for an option. That is what premium is. So you're not going to just buy, buy these options and pay nothing for them. You have to pay a premium to be involved in these derivatives and you make a lot more money if these um, options go above the strike price. That is essentially how it works in very layman's terms. And if you're a seller of options, which I'm personally a seller of options, I love selling options, you are essentially creating this contract for the buyer and the buyer pays you the premium and you have to have 100 shares of a particular stock to even sell options. And that's a little bit more advanced. I'm going to let you guys know that I do have a video on selling options. Go to the, uh, maybe in the description box, I'll put it, or you can go to the search bar and type in Stasurfest selling covered calls. That is what I personally do all the time. I like creating um, these calls collecting the premium. And if you're a seller, guys, you're not really taking much risk. There's really no risk at all. There's a little bit of, I mean, there's a little bit of risk, but the buyers are taking the majority of the risk. And there's a stat out there. I think 80, 85% of option contracts expire worthless, which means if you're a buyer, most of the time, you're going to lose a lot of your money, if not all of your money. And being the seller is the winning strategy. You know, think about a casino. You know, casinos, yes, you can go, you can win money in the casino, but the house always wins. It's the same thing with options. You could buy options, make money, but if you're selling these options, you are, you know, your rate of winning is a lot higher. So that's premium, that's strike price. Let's talk about in the money. In the money, ITM is what um, the options people uh, call that, ITM. You know, options that are in the money have intrinsic value. When the stock price is higher than the strike price, that's good for the call option buyer. So with our example before, Apple's at 180, it goes to 200, which is the strike price. Let's say it's above 200, that's a call option that's in the money, a put option is in the money if the stock price is lower than the strike price. Let's say Apple's at 180 right now. And with our example earlier, we want Apple or we think Apple is going to go to 150 in two months. Let's say it goes under 150 before that two months is up. That is a put option that is in the money. And out of the money means these options, calls or puts, have no intrinsic value. A call option is out of the money if the stock price is lower than the stri uh, strike price. A put option is out of the money when the stock price is higher than the strike price. So keep that in mind. Intrinsic value options are in the money. 
There's no intrinsic value when they're out of the money. And the options writer, which is the last basic term here, is the person that sold you the contract, the options contract. They receive the premium. Like I said, I sell calls. I like doing that. I like, you know, giving them to people, selling them, and uh, I just create premium for myself. I keep that money as income, and it's just extra income for me for simply holding my stock and selling calls against it. So let's talk about short selling. Short selling is a very interesting way that people make money out there, and this is probably the most advanced. Well, there's some option strategies that are probably more advanced than this, but short selling, I would not mess with it if I'm a beginner or honestly an intermediate trader investor um, as well. You know, this is probably more for the advanced people out there. So short selling allows you to make money when a stock is going down in price. And like I said, this is very risky. I wouldn't do this unless I was advanced in the stock market. And it involves people borrowing shares from their brokerage, then immediately selling them on the open market in order to buy them back later on, hopefully at a lower price, like we mentioned earlier in this video, to return to their brokerage that they originally borrowed the shares from, you know, who they borrowed them from, the brokerage. And when you're short selling, you have to pay an interest rate on the borrowed shares. So this is interesting because if you short sell and you're not right with your timing, let's say the stock, you want the stock to go down when you're short selling, understand that. But let's say you short sell and then the stock starts shooting up. <laughs> and then you're you're paying this interest as well to the uh, brokerage. You're you're in a pickle. You know the stock's going up, which when you're short selling, stock's going up. You're losing money right off the bat, and then you also have to pay interest. You're in trouble. So with short selling, you guys have to nail the timing, which is a very hard thing to do. But if you do do it right, let's say you do nail the timing, you short sell, you borrow the brokerage's shares, you sell them on the open market, you buy them back at a lower price, you make out like a bandit. But it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to do that on top of paying interest, which sometimes the uh, the interest is 5 6 7%. It really depends on the time period. And the risk here is that the stock could continue climbing and you can lose unlimited amount of money. That's the scary thing. With short selling, look into it, guys. We're not going to get too deep into it here, but you can lose an unlimited amount of money and you can be you, you, you could get screwed with your brokerage. Let's just put it that way. And the last point here, like I've already mentioned, timing has to be on point. You have to nail the timing. And if you do, kudos to you. You're going to make money short selling. But for me personally, guys, and I know a lot of people out there are the same way. They don't really even mess with short selling. And that's the truth. We don't really mess. Um, I don't really mess. I don't want to say everybody, but I don't mess with short selling pretty much ever. I've done it before here and there, but it's, uh, it's a dangerous game. So keep that in mind when it comes to short selling. So now let's talk about some retirement accounts and the benefits of these retirement accounts, starting off with my personal favorite. And if you guys don't have this, you got to get on it. You got to get one. It's a Roth IRA. This allows you to contribute after tax dollars that will grow tax free into retirement. And the income limit is um, I think it's like 150 grand, something like that. So if you make less than 150 grand a year, you can do a Roth IRA. And don't worry, if you make more than 150 grand a year, you can do a backdoor Roth IRA, which essentially means you can get around the uh, parameters and still contribute to a Roth IRA. It gets, it's a little bit um, more complicated than that, but in the same breath, it's really not that complicated either. Just talk to your CPA about it. So what a Roth IRA is, let's say, for example, you make money, you pay taxes on this money today, you can then put money in a Roth IRA and then it grows tax free. When you retire at 59 and a half or whenever you retire, um, you, you can withdraw that money at 59 and a half and you don't pay a single dime in taxes. It's crazy. So you pay taxes up front on this money, you put it in a Roth IRA up to six thousand dollars per year and 
you take out that money tax-free. You don't pay capital gains tax. You don't pay taxes on your dividends. Literally nothing. Zippo, zero, no taxes paid, which I absolutely love. And quite honestly, I wish the Roth IRA lets you put more than six grand a year. That's the only downside or not even downside, but the only negative because six grand a year, although that's that's a good chunk of money. I mean, long term, if you compound that, it's going to be over a million, maybe even more than that, depending on what you invest in. But six grand, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, compared to the uh, 401k, it's uh, not not a lot. You know, if it was 10 grand, that'd be better. 15 grand, even better. But it, it's uh, it, it's good. It's good either way. You know, contributing to a Roth IRA, six grand a year, 500 bucks a month. There's no reason not to do it. The other retirement account that probably a lot of you watching this video you're contributing to is a 401k. This allows you to contribute pre-tax dollars that will get taxed later on in retirement. So what that means is, let's say you make $100,000 and you throw in whatever, nineteen five per year, which is the uh, contribution limit, 19500 per year. You can put that much in per year and you don't pay taxes on that now, but you do pay when you retire and you start withdrawing that money. So that's the key difference with the Roth IRA and the 401k. With the Roth IRA, you pay taxes now, but you don't pay taxes later in, in retirement. It grows tax-free, but the 401k, you don't pay taxes now and then you pay taxes in retirement. So keep that in mind. And both of them, Roth and 401k, the uh, age to you know withdraw is 59 and a half. And the 401k, the biggest advantage is the employer match. You know, a lot of companies give a 3% match. You know, let's say you put in a percentage, they match that percentage, 3%. And that's essentially free money. So if you're working a job, I don't have a job, but you, if you're working a job and you have a 401k option and they match your contributions, you got to do that. It's free money. At least put in up to the employer match and then invest the uh, rest of your money into maybe a Roth IRA, a taxable brokerage. And some other retirement accounts include SEP IRAs. This is for, you know, um, uh, people that are self-employed, traditional IRAs, 403B, 457. And if you guys aren't educated on this stuff, the retirement accounts, seriously, get into it, understand it. It's uh, it's it's a true way to make a, a lot of money in retirement, and it's uh, it's a set it and forget it type of thing. You know, you you open up a Roth, a four hundred one k, whatever. You throw money. You just keep buying every month, every couple months. You could even do lump sum investments once a year, and uh, long term, you're going to be in a good spot. So we talked about some basic options terms. Now let's talk about some stock market terms in general that everybody, you, me. Everybody and their grandmother must know these terms, guys. So we have market cap, also known as market capitalization. We have dividends, ex-dividend date, earnings per share, also known as EPS. We have bull market, and we have bear market. So let's start off with market capitalization. This refers to the total dollar market value of a company's outstanding shares of stocks uh, or stock. In other words, that is what the company is worth. You know, you see Apple these days is around a $2 trillion market cap, maybe a little bit more, um, 2.3, 2.4, something like that. We have Google, $1.5 trillion, maybe $2 trillion, I forget. Um, we have companies like PayPal, $4. 400 billion. We have companies like Tattoo Chef, some small cap companies with market caps in the uh, one, two billion dollar range. So the market cap, you can calculate this by multiplying the market price per share of a stock by the total shares outstanding. So let's say Apple is $180 per share. You take the total share amount out there, shares outstanding is what that is. You multiply those two together and boom, you have the market capitalization of the stock. Dividends. What the heck are dividends? We've kind of already talked about these throughout this video, but a dividend is an amount of money paid regularly to shareholders straight from earnings 
or reserves. And this is paid mostly, you know, most companies pay dividends every quarter, so four times a year. But there are companies that pay um, twice a year. And there's a few companies, and really not that many, but there are a few that pay once a year. Activision Blizzard is one of those. Full disclosure, I personally own that stock, and they pay dividends every single May. So that's coming up here um, in a couple of months from when I'm filming this video. So that's dividends, money that you're paid pretty much every quarter or a couple times a year, depending on the uh, company from earnings or reserves. X dividend date, the X date or X dividend date is the trading date on and after which the dividend is not owed to a new buyer of the stock. So let's say, for example, I buy a stock and the X dividend date is January 1st for, um, you know, a basic date, right? Let's say the X dividend date is January 1st. If I buy the stock before the X dividend date, let's say now December 29th, I will be entitled to to that dividend. But if I buy the stock on the X dividend date or after the X dividend date, I will not get the dividend for that payment. I will get the dividend the next time they pay it, but I will not be receiving it. So understand, if you want to get the most recent dividend from a company, you have to buy the stock before the X dividend date. That's all you need to know. And a bull market, let's go to bull market, bear market. A bull market is the condition of financial markets where prices are expected to rise. So let's say a stock or a market in general, the S&P 500 has gone up 20% in a year. 10%, it's gone up 500% over 10 years. That is a bull market. But let's say it's gone down 20% in a year. Let's say it's gone down 50% in, in, in a year or two. That is a bear market. So a bear market is when prices are falling or they're expected to fall. And the opposite is a bull market. That's what you need to know. You know, a lot of people get this confused. What's a bull? What's a bear? So if somebody's a bull, they think the markets are going up. If somebody is a bear, they think the markets are going down. They typically have a more pessimistic view of everything. So those are what? Five, what is that? Five, six, actually. Six key terms that you need to know about the stock market. And and there's many more, but those, you got to know them. So here are some other ones. Remember market cap, you take the price of a stock and you multiply it by shares outstanding to get market cap. Well, outstanding shares, that is another term that you guys need to know. Shares outstanding refer to a company's stock currently held by all its shareholders, including share blocks held by institutional investors, restricted shares owned by the company's officers, and insiders uh insiders so outstanding shares pretty much all the uh shares out there and again you take this number multiplied by the market or uh, the price of the stock to get the market cap it's that simple initial public offering what the heck is that what is an ipo what is it well let's talk about it an ipo is the first sale or offering of a stock by a company to the public so you guys know companies they don't just wake up one day you start a company and then you go on the public markets that's not how it works how it happens is you start a company from the ground up you gain mo uh, money you, you uh, raise money from private investors, whatever, and then you slowly start building the company. And then one day you want to list that company onto the public markets. You want to do an initial public offering. So just, just, just look at the term initial public offering. So the public gets the initial piece of the company or they're now able to invest. So when a company IPOs, that is when you, me, people that are retail investors, we can actually put money into these uh, companies during an IPO or uh, after an IPO. And the thing is with IPO guys, you know, when companies do IPOs, a lot of the early on investors, they end up selling out because, you know, when, when a company IPOs, 
it's worth a lot more than it initially was when private investors were initially investing in it when the company was a lot smaller. So does that make sense? You know, when a company first starts out, it's not big. It's, uh, it's growing, but it's not big quite yet. So the people that are early on investing in it when it's a private company, they end up selling out when it IPOs a lot of the time, and they make a crap ton of money. So keep that in mind with IPO. Ticker symbol. Ticker symbol is an abbreviation used to uniquely identify publicly traded shares of a particular stock on a particular stock market. So Apple, Apple's ticker symbol is AAPL. So if you want to look at what Apple stock is doing, go to Google, go to your charting software, whatever you guys are looking at, type in AAPL. Apple is going to pop up. If you want to look at Starbucks stock, type in SBUX. Starbucks is going to pop up. SBUX is their ticker symbol. You want to look at Google. G-O-O-G. That's how you look at Google. You want to look at Johnson & Johnson. J-N-J is their ticker symbol. Pretty simple, right? Um, dollar cost averaging, also known as DCA, DCAing, dollar cost averaging, whatever you want to call it. This is an investment strategy in which an investor divides up the total amount to be invested across periodic purchases of a target asset in an effort to reduce the impact of volatility on the overall purchase. So let's say you have 10 grand, 10 grand guys, $10,000, and you want a dollar cost average. What that means is, let's say, um, actually, let's say 12 grand. Let's say you're going to buy $1,000 on the first of each month. That is dollar cost averaging. You're not lump sum investing where you would put 12000 in on, let's say, the first of the year. That's lump sum investing. You put all your money in at once. Dollar cost averaging is you put a little bit in, uh, a little bit in at a time, 1000 each month, and then over the year, it should smooth out your cost basis because you didn't go all in at first. You slowly averaged in. That's dollar cost averaging. And let's talk a little bit about blue chip stocks. Blue chip stocks are large, stable, and well-known companies that are often profitable, and these companies pay consistent dividends. Think of companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble. The list goes on. These are blue chip stocks companies. They've been around for a long time. They're profitable. They have a strong track record. They're not fly-by-night companies that just popped up yesterday and now they're uh, you know, they're trading on the New York Stock Exchange. These are blue chip companies, guys. They're reliable. They've been paying dividends for a while. Their earnings, revenue, very reliable. That is a blue chip stock. So when you're buying stocks, let's say you're on Fidelity, you're on Robinhood, Webull, M1 Finance, TD Ameritrade, whatever. Let's say you're on these platforms. There are different ways that you can actually buy stocks. Well, I guess not on um, M1 Finance. That, that one's a bit different. But let's say Fidelity, for example. You have different orders. You can put in different orders types and I want to talk about them. So number one, market order. This is a type of stock market order that provides instruction to buy or sell as quickly as possible at whatever price is currently available. So when you're buying stocks, there is a bid, there's an ask. We're not going to get too deep into that, but what you guys need to know about market orders is whatever price the stock is trading at, if you go and you want to buy Google or something or PayPal and it's trading at 150 bucks right now, for example, on the open market, it's the middle of the trading day. You go to market order, you click buy or place order, whatever it is going to fill. That trade is going to fill at whatever the price is during the day. Whenever you click that buy order, whatever the stock price is at, at that point in time, that is what price you're going to get, right? That's a market order. A limit order is very different, very different. This is a type of stock market order that provides instruction to only execute at a certain price. So let's say you want PayPal stock, you, you don't want it at whatever price it's at in the market that day. Let's say you want it at 
specifically $145.32. Let's just throw a random dollar value out there. If you want that price, you can literally go on Fidelity, do a limit order, say buy at $145.32, and if it gets there, keyword is if, you're going to get filled. You're going to own that stock at that exact price price. Now, it's not guaranteed to get filled. You know, you might not get filled. And by filled, I mean, you are not going to get uh, your uh, your order might not execute. You know, you might not actually get the stock if it doesn't get to your limit order price, right? That makes sense, right, guys? So good till canceled. What is a good till canceled order? It's, uh, it's a type of stock market order to buy or sell shares that remains open until the trade is made or you cancel the order. So good till cancel. The uh, proof is in the pudding. Or um, what am I trying to say here? It's uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? Good till canceled. You uh, put an order in. It's called GTC. And then if you want to cancel it, go ahead. If you want to let it get filled, whatever. It gets filled. So that's a good till canceled order. A OCO order or a one cancels the other order is a pair of conditional orders stipulating that if one order executes, then the other order is automatically canceled. So let's say, for example, I own a stock I have a um, you know a limit sell and then I have a, a stop loss as well. So if my stop loss hits, which means if the stock goes down, I want to cut losses at a certain point, it's going to cancel the other limit um, you know limit buy or limit sell or however I, I, I said it right. So one cancels the other. You have two orders. If one hits, the other cancels. If the other hits, the other cancels. That simple. A stop loss order is an order placed with a broker to buy or sell a security when it reaches a certain price. Stop loss orders are designed to limit an investor's loss on a position in a security. So let's say, for example, I own um, what stock? What stock are we going to use for this example? Um, we might as well use Apple again, right? <laughs> let's say I own Apple at $180, and if it goes under um, $160, I want to cut my losses. I don't want to own it if it drops under 160. I'm going to put a stop loss order at $160. So if it hits 160, it sells my shares automatically. I don't have to worry about it. It stops my loss. That's why it's called a stop loss order. And then we have a fill or kill. A fill or kill order is an order to buy or sell a stock that must be executed immediately in its entirety. Otherwise, the entire order will be canceled. So sometimes when you do a market order, it fills your shares. Let's say you want to buy a thousand shares. Sometimes with a market order, some of the shares you buy, you're, you're going to get filled at $150.85. Some of the other ones might get filled at $150.87, you know, at, at different prices, you know, and they vary by cents usually. So it's not that big of a deal. But if you don't want that, you know, the, the different prices, you do a filler kill. Filler kill is if, if it doesn't execute at that price and in its entirety the order gets killed it's that simple so now let's talk about valuation metrics this is very important because when you're buying stocks out there for the long term you don't want to just pay any any price you don't want to just buy a stock at whatever price it's selling at and uh just just be cool with it. You want to be able to buy stocks at a cheap price, uh, maybe not extremely undervalued because stocks don't always, they're not always extremely undervalued. There's only certain periods of time when stocks are very undervalued, but you want to buy them near fair value and undervalued. You want to avoid stocks that are ridiculously overvalued. Like we mentioned earlier in this video, right? When you go and buy a, a, a shirt or you go do some grocery shopping, you have some coupons or there's sales, 30, 40% off. That is when you get excited. That's when you want to buy. It's the same thing with the stock market. You want to see companies that their stocks are trading at very low prices, undervalued, near fair value, under fair value, um, not overvalued. And these metrics here, although there's many other metrics to use, these here that we're going to talk about will help you understand whether you're overpaying, underpaying. So listen up. Price to earnings, P-E ratio is what this is known as. The price to earnings ratio 
is the ratio for valuing a company that measures its current share price relative to its earnings per share. It allows you to determine whether or not a company is over or undervalued. A high P ratio could mean that a stock's price is expensive relative to its earnings. You calculate the PE by taking the company's price per share and dividing it by the earnings per share. And if a company doesn't make profit, let's say they're unprofitable, which means they don't make profit, right? Um, they're not going to have a, a price to earnings ratio. There's not going to be a PE ratio. So keep that in mind. And let's do this. Um, let's use Apple for an example. I'll put a screenshot up right here. You guys can see it. So Apple right now is trading at 179.50 and their earnings per share in the last 12 months is around $5.61. So to calculate the price to earnings ratio, we take that 179.50 divided by 5.6 and then we get a price to earnings ratio of 32. And the way that you value companies, guys, is you compare the price to earnings ratio to similar companies in the industry. So if you're looking at airlines, right, you're looking at UAL, United Airlines, American Airlines, Southwest, you want to see how, let's say, American Airlines price to earnings ratio compares to LUV, Southwest, or, you know, the other airlines. Let's say American Airlines price uh, to earnings ratio is a lot lower than the other airlines. It might be undervalued compared to to those other companies and you might want to dig deeper into it. And another way you can look at this is, okay, let's say the S&P 500, the EPS or uh, the PE ratio for the S&P is currently a 25 and Apple is a 32. Apple trades at a premium compared to the overall market and it works in the opposite direction as well. Let's say Apple's PE was a 15, the S&P's is a 25. Apple trades at a discount to the overall market. So P ratio, it's great. I love using it and I personally analyze stocks using that pretty much all the time. You know, whenever I'm looking to buy a stock, I'm looking at price to earnings ratio. Price to sales ratio is another one. This is calculated by taking a company's market capitalization, which we talked about earlier, the number of shares divided by or multiplied by the share price and you take the uh, you know the market cap and divide it by companies the company's total sales or revenue over the past 12 months that's how you get price to sales the lower the price to sales ratio the more uh, more attractive the investment is and I personally use this ratio for growth companies that are losing money or in other words they don't make profit which again price to earnings ratio you can't use this ratio on companies that that make or that don't make money, which is why you have to use the price to sales ratio on companies that don't make money. So let's say, for example, um, we have a company with a price to sales ratio of a two, a three. That's pretty good. A one. That's fantastic. But let's say there's one that has a price to sales ratio of a 30, a 50. Dare I say 100? That is very overvalued. So keep that in mind for price to sales ratio. Price to book ratio. Let's talk a little bit about this. This measures whether a stock is over or undervalued by comparing the net asset or net value rather, which is assets minus liabilities of a company to its market capitalization. So the PB ratio is a good indication of what investors are willing to pay for each dollar of a company's net value. Again, asset minus liabilities and value investors often consider uh, stocks with a PB price to book under three and personally guys I look at price to book don't get me wrong but I put more emphasis at least with my style of investing I like investing in um, higher growth companies and uh, maybe not necessarily all in on value stocks, me personally. So PB is used more for the value investors out there, price to sales, price to earnings. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. All of these are used for all different types of investing. But for me, I put more weight on price to sales and price to earnings. Price to earnings growth ratio is another one, guys, also known as the PEG ratio, the PEG ratio. This is used to determine a stock's value while also factoring in the company's expected earnings growth 
and it is thought to provide a more complete picture than the more standard P-E ratio. The P-E-G ratio measures the relationship between the P-E ratio and earnings growth. So we have P-E ratio and earnings growth. You can calculate the PEG ratio by taking a stock's P-E, so we talked about P with the uh, Apple example, right, and dividing it by the growth rate of its earnings over a specific or a specified period of time. So let's say Apple grew their um, earnings by 10% a year for the past five years. You take their five-year P ratio, you take it uh, or divide it by, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rate of growth, and that is the PEG ratio. And one of my favorite ones, guys, one of my favorite ones is the current ratio. We'll talk more about this when we go over balance sheet a little bit later in this video, but the current ratio ratio is a liquidity ratio that measures a company's ability to pay short-term obligations or those due within one year. And in my opinion, this is one of the best ways to determine whether or not a company is financially healthy or financially sick. I guess we can, I guess we can say it like that. Um, th this is one of my favorite ways to do it. It tells investors and analysts how a company can maximize the current assets on its balance sheet to satisfy its current debt and other payables. You calculate this by dividing, it's very simple, current assets divided by current liabilities. That's simple. And current assets are those that can be converted into cash within one year, while current liabilities are obligations expected to be paid within one year. A good current ratio is typically considered to be anywhere between 1.5 and three. And we will talk more about this later in the video. So another valuation metric that I personally like to look at and I use all the time is the Schiller PE ratio, also known as the CAPE ratio. And I believe there's a lot of other terms that people call this, but pretty much it's all the same, right? There's different names for it, but it's all the same. It's the Schiller P ratio. And what you're looking at right here is the Schiller P from 1880. We're going back about 140 years here, exactly 140 years, all the way to 2020, right? So this is 140 years of data right here. And the Schiller PE is defined as the price divided by the average of 10 years of earnings, the moving average, adjusted for inflation. So essentially, we covered price to earnings earlier, right? You take the price of a stock divided by the uh, earnings per share. That's how you get PE ratio. So what this is showing us is the uh, you know the 10 year average, 10 year smoothed out average of price to earnings um, for the S and P 500. So it's showing the 10 year essentially 10 year moving average um, P for the S and P 500. And obviously the higher a PE is, the more overvalued. The lower a PE is, the less overvalued or undervalued, right? It's it's more undervalued the lower a PE is. So this is going to show you a lot of um, overvalued markets throughout time. And you can see the peaks here. You had Black Tuesday back in um, 1929. I think that was. We had Black Monday in the 70s. We had a pretty high uh, Schiller P. Then we had a crash and Black Tuesday, very high Schiller P, followed by a crash. Then we had 1999, the dot-com bubble. That is where we had um, a very high Schiller P, the highest to date, um, roughly a 45. And you guys know what happened after that, right? The bubble burst. We had, you know, a lot of uh, stocks go out of business, bankrupt, companies go bankrupt, stocks went to zero. And then we saw the bubble deflate from a uh, Schiller P of 45, which is very overvalued. Then we got pretty reasonable. We got down to roughly a 15 um, Schiller P. That was during the um, 08 crash. And now you guys take a look. Can you, can you see this? Look at the chart, guys. We are now at a 38 point seven Schiller PE. So we're well above Black Tuesday. We're well above Black Monday. Um, and now we're approaching the dot com bubble levels of PE. And I'm not telling you guys, look, it's uh, it's overvalued. We're heading for another crash. I'm not necessarily saying that, but understand when you're looking at overall markets, when you're trying to evaluate the overall markets to see if we're in a frothy market, meaning we're pretty overvalued, we're too extended, or we're in an undervalued market, way too beaten down market, you have to look at 
the overall market in general. And the Schiller PE is a great way to do that. And you could also look at other metrics like, um, you know, GDP. What's what's the one? Debt to GDP. We're not going to get into that, but there's a lot that you could look at. And for me to kind of value the overall markets, I love looking at Schiller PE. So keep in mind, guys, I'm not trying to freak you out, but as of now, we are very high when it comes to, you know, the uh, past 140 years of data here and uh, the overall PE ratio for the S&P 500. So let's move on and talk about the different financial statements. We have income statement, we have balance sheet, and we have the statement of cash flow. So let's break these down. Number one, we have the income statement, which you guys are seeing right here. Let me make my face a bit smaller so you can, um, so I can make sure you guys um, can see this. So it shows a company's profit and loss over a period of time. The profit or loss is determined by taking all revenues and subtracting all expenses from both operating and non-operating activities. The income statement focuses on four key items. We have revenue, expenses, we have gains, and we have losses. It starts with the details of sales and then works down to compute the net income and eventually the earnings per share, also known as EPS for short. You guys probably know that at this point. And essentially, it gives an account of how the net revenue realized by the company gets transformed into net earnings or a loss, right? Profit or a loss. And like we mentioned earlier in this video, businesses that are growing, they are growing 30, 40, 50, 60% revenue top line per year. They're not going to be making, for the most part, profits. They're looking to reinvest money. They're willing to take a loss now in order to grow their business as much as possible. And then later, they're going to focus on, um, you know, making uh, profits, right? That's what we see overall. That's how the business cycle works. So what you're seeing here on the left is a screenshot from Investopedia. And what you guys have to understand is stocks are not just numbers on a screen, lines on a chart. There's a lot more to it. Sure, if you're trading short-term, day trading, swing trading, like we talked about earlier, you can look at just lines on a chart. You're not going to really care about the numbers. But if you want to buy a company for the long term, remember what we said. You want to underpay. You want to pay under fair value or as close to fair value as possible. You don't want to pay overvalued um, for, you know, overpriced or a, a, a very high price. Let's put it that way. I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but you, you don't want to overpay. Let's put it that way. And the way to do that is to analyze stocks using the different uh, ratios, metrics we talked about before. And you have to look under the hood. Essentially, the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows, these three statements are going to allow you to uh, really judge whether or not a company is financially sound or not. It's that simple. It's like popping up the hood of a truck or a car. Um, well, maybe not a Tesla. It's electric. But let's say you have a, a gas car. You know, you pop the hood. You can see whether or not the car. Well, well, I can't do it. I'm not a big car guy. But if you understand cars, you can pop the hood and you can see whether or not the car is good. It's working. It's running. It's solid. It has more life in it. Or it's about to die. It's the same thing with companies. So in this example, we have total revenue of about, what is this? Is this in thousands? Let's just say it's in thousands. Um, we have total revenue of $30,000. We have all these expenses, right? We have uh, procurement costs, wages, rent, interest paid, transportation, utilities. So we have the total expenses of about $10,600. And it's very simple. We have gains, income from sale of a van, losses, settlement costs of a, a consumer lawsuit. And then overall, you take all of this revenue plus gains minus expenses plus losses, and you get net income. That in a nutshell is uh, how you calculate you know, the income statement or, you know, that's what an income statement is comprised of. You have revenues, expenses, gains, losses, and then you come down to the bottom line where you have net income, whether it's a, a, a game 
or it's a loss, profit or a loss. So that's income statement. Very, very important, guys. Very important. And once you, you know, start getting your feet wet, you look through a bunch of these income statements, it becomes like second nature. I remember when I first started in the stock market, it was uh, it was difficult at first trying to understand all of these um, different uh, metrics. You know, what, what does this mean? What does that mean? But once you get your feet wet, you gain some experience. It's, uh, it's really like second nature. It's like riding a bike. You know, you look at the assets like Abilities, income, expenses, and you run through it and you're like, okay, this looks pretty good. And this is the balance sheet. Balance sheet is extremely important. Very, very important. This shows assets and liabilities. And the balance sheet, um, like I said, focuses on a company's assets, liabilities, and shareholder equity. I almost forgot about that. Shareholder equity at a specific point in time. The balance sheet is a financial statement that provides a snapshot of what a company owns and owes, as well as the amount invested by shareholders. Investors can get a grasp of a company's financial well-being by using a number of ratios, like the current ratio, you guys remember before, where we went over current assets, over current liabilities, very important. Um, investors, traders, whatever, they can use a bunch of these ratios that can be derived from the balance sheet. So let's look at this example. On the left, we have assets. We have current assets. We have different investments. We have intangible assets. And on the right, we have current liabilities, long-term liabilities. And then we have the total liability, stockholders, equity. So what I personally like to see when I'm looking at a balance sheet is I like seeing more assets sets than liabilities. Um, try and put it into perspective with your own life as a as a person, not not a company. But let's say personally, when you're looking at your personal finances, you want to have more assets than liabilities, right? What are liabilities? Credit card debt, student loans, um, car debt, mortgage. I, I mean, I guess we're not going to put mortgage in it, even though it is a debt. But let's say you you know, okay, you could put mortgage as well. You want to have more assets than liabilities. So what are assets? You have homes, rental properties, um, personal properties, stocks, um, you know, what else? Maybe crypto, if you want to put crypto in the asset category, maybe art, maybe, um, you know, some, some exotic uh, assets that maybe a lot of people don't think of, maybe cars or collectible ca uh, cards. So, you know, sports cards. So you want to have more assets than liabilities. It's the same thing for a company. So in this example, current assets are sitting at around 89,000 where total current liabilities are 61,000. So that's very good. They have more total current assets than current liabilities. And remember, current assets are assets you can liquidate within 12 months. Liabilities, current liabilities are liabilities that are owned are owed rather um, within 12 months. So more current assets than current liabilities and I want to take it a step further. I want to see um, a company have more cash and cash equivalents than total current liabilities. And in this example, this company does not have that. Um, they have current cash. Let's see, what's the cash at? Cash and short-term investments is at around 12,000, where total current liabilities are about 61,000. So they don't have enough cash on hand to cover total current liabilities. I personally like seeing more cash on hand than current liabilities. If you guys look through a lot of companies these days, um, especially tech companies, most, I don't want to say most of them, but a lot of them have more cash than, than they know what to do with. And they have more cash than current liabilities. So if they wanted to, they can write off a check. What that means is guys, if they wanted to, they can write a check and pay off all of their liabilities. That is a very healthy financial spot to be in. And that's kind of what I look for um, when I'm investing in a company for the long term. I want to see a healthy balance sheet. I want a nice cash position. I want them to be able to pay off their liabilities. No problem. Because look, when we get into a recession, when things are rough, you want to be invested in healthy companies that are not going to go under. Because if you have money and risky fly-by-night businesses with a lot of liabilities, they're the first ones to go bankrupt in a recession. But if you're in 
a business that has a lot of cash, a lot of assets, way more than liabilities, you are going to be in a pretty good spot. So keep that in mind when it comes to balance sheet. Statement of cash flows is another one that's pretty important here. Very important, actually. Um, this statement summarizes the amount of cash and cash equivalents entering and leaving a company during a specific period of time. The CFS cash flow statement measures how well a company manages its cash position, meaning how well the company generates cash to pay its debt obligations and fund its operating expenses. The main components of the CFS are cash from three areas. We have operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. And you guys can see an example here on the left. You can see at the top here, we have cash flows from operating activities at about 230000 We have net income, depreciation, and amortization. We have loss on sale of equipment. So all these numbers are very important. So the first block here, net cash provided by operating activities is about 262000 Then we go under that. Cash flows from investing activities is about negative 260000 because we had capital expenditures of minus 300000 We had proceeds from sale of equipment at 40000 So that comes in at minus 260000 Then we have cash flows from financing activities at around 200000 Dividends paid. So dividends paid, that means the company is giving money to shareholders. So that is um, a, 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 a negative here on the um, uh, statement of cash flows. So overall, net cash provided by financing activities is $90,000. And then we have net increase in cash during the year, 92000 cash at the beginning of the year, 101000 and that equals to about 193000 cash at the end of the year. So you want to see cash flow growing over time. You want to look at a statement of cash flows for a business, and you want that number going up. And if you are a dividend investor, you want to make sure, this is very important, that the cash the, the net cash that a company produces on the st uh, statement of cash flows covers that dividend because a lot of people, they see a very high dividend yield a company's paying a lot of uh, a lot of money to shareholders, and this uh, this could be a dividend trap. I like calling these dividend traps because it's just a short term payment to get you guys into the business to get you invested. It's kind of like um, a business is trying to lure you in with a very high dividend that they know is not sustainable. A lot of businesses take out debt to pay a dividend. They uh, they're just throwing too much money into a dividend that's not sustainable. So what you want to make sure is if you're looking for dividends, guys, the dividend has been paid for a long time. It's growing over time and they can easily cover the dividend with the cash on the, uh, the, the net cash on the statement of cash flows. And I don't want to get too deep into that because again, this is a beginner based video, but understand cash flow statement is very, very important. Now let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about technical analysis, right? We covered the financial statements, very important for long-term investments, the financial statements are. Um, but now let's switch gears a little bit to trading. Remember we talked talked about earlier day trading, swing trading, options trading. I'm a I'm a, a big believer in all of this stuff. Again, once you build a foundation, once you build a long-term foundation which could include ETFs like the S&P 500 ETF, you know, individual stocks that are very strong, competitive advantages. Um, once you build your portfolio, then you can start your long-term portfolio. Then you can start, in my opinion, and this is how I did it and how I'm still doing it, um, then you can start trading and you can start focusing on technical analysis. You know, you can start focusing on the short-term stuff in the stock market, short-term news, you know, momentum, day trading, swing trading, options trading trading, even though I'm not a big proponent of um, buying short-term calls or short-term puts. I used to do that, but I got my boots smoked, guys. I'll be honest. I lost a lot of money doing that. So like I said earlier, these days, I'm just sticking to selling options. So listen, guys, technical analysis, it's uh, it's an important uh, discipline that you guys 
have to master. So this is a trading discipline employed to evaluate investments and identify trading opportunities by analyzing statistical trends gathered by trading activity, such as price movement and volume. And there's way more than that. But understand, when you're doing technical analysis, you're looking at um, price action, if a stock's breaking out, selling off, if it's trading flat, and you're looking at things like volume, different indicators like the RSI, the relative strength index, which pretty much shows whether or not a stock is overbought oversold. You're looking at different moving averages like the 50 moving average, the 180 moving average, 200 moving average. So you can see how a stock has um, been, been moving over time. So that's very important, right? Technical analysts, and I would consider myself one of these people, believe past trading activity and price changes of a security can be valuable indicators of the security's future price movements. And a lot of people say, well, what's the uh, cliche? phrase here. Um, technical analysis is like uh, astrology for traders or something like that because um, maybe astrology is a bunch of BS or um, the weather the weather channel it's it's kind of like you're forecasting things but you don't know what's really going to happen yes it, you don't really know what's going to happen but trust me I've been doing technical analysis for years at this point it's definitely something worth having in your war chest in your tool belt understanding chart patterns because a lot of the time People are looking at charts, and if a lot of people are looking at charts, the charts typically play out how the majority of people think they will. Not always, but it, it plays out a lot, you know, the way that uh, people map it out, especially if you have long-term experience with this stuff, you understand how things move, and if you watch the same stocks all the time, and this is what I do. I have a, a watch list of 15, 20 stocks. I track these stocks all the time. You are going to understand the price action with those particular stocks, I'm telling you. And looking at charts um, or doing technical analysis is essentially analyzing charts, like I said, looking at price action and using different indicators to make decisions. So let's move on a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about this. We have technical analysis number two. This is another slide that uh, I put together for you guys that's showing you different candlestick patterns. And I'm probably going to make a video more in depth on candlestick patterns, technical analysis, because we don't, we can't, we just can't go too deep into it in this video, considering this video is going to be two hours long, probably even more. So listen, technical analysis is important. Be familiar with these different candlestick formations to spot bullish and bearish patterns forming in different stocks. So when you're doing analysis, guys, technical analysis, and the more you get into it, the more you understand this, you're going to pretty easily be able to identify stocks that are just way too hot in need of a reversal and, and to the downside, I mean, and stocks that are just way too beaten down that are in need of a, of, of a reversal to the upside. And, you know, watching these different patterns like a hammer, a, a bullish engulfing candlestick, bearish engulfing, um, a piercing line, you know, looking at all these different ones and studying them, they will help you uh, determine where a reversal could occur whether or not a stock is near a top, a bottom, and no, this is not 100% accurate. If it was, everybody would be rich. But like I said, it works more often than not, and why not have some technical analysis skills in your tool belt, in your war chest, so you can really um, maximize your gains. And if you don't want to be super hands-on, then just don't even worry about technical analysis, quite honestly. Just buy ETFs, buy individual stocks, hold long-term, and then just go on with your life. Not everybody wants to be super hands-on with the markets. A lot of people just want to buy, hold, and, and, and just go on and, and live their lives. And I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not one of those people. I like being super hands-on. On. I do this full time and uh, it's just one of my, um, I don't even want to say a passion at this point. Well, it is a passion, but it's just great. I love it, man. I just love doing this stuff and uh, who knows, maybe one day I might not like 
doing technical analysis every day anymore, but at this point in time, it's great, and uh, just learning these different formations will really help you overall when it comes to this. And this is another slide on technical analysis here. We have um, some different chart patterns. So we have the candlestick formations, which are great for spotting reversals, change in trend, and these different patterns are great as well um, to watch out for. So being able to spot different patterns from an ascending triangle, which I always like uh, spotting those, a descending triangle, a falling wedge, a rising wedge, a double top, uh, a double bottom. These different, um, you know, spotting these different patterns will allow you to make better decisions when making short-term trades. So, for example, if you see a stock that's uh, forming a double top and is starting to curl down, that might mean a sell-off is coming. Or on the flip side, if we're seeing a stock double bottom, you know, let's say it hit $10, dollars ran up to 11 hit 10 again and now it's starting to rip towards 12 that could be a sign of a breakout so being able to spot these patterns is great when you're looking to make short-term trades and trying to watch out for these patterns forming along with the candlestick formations from the previous slide that we talked about um, this will allow you to pinpoint entry points and exit points. So look at some of these patterns, guys. We have the ascending triangle on the top left, which is a breakout formation that forms. We call those out all the time on my YouTube channel. So make sure you guys subscribe. We post daily updates every single day. And if you haven't done so already, hit the like button, guys. This video, uh, putting this video together took a lot of work for me, and I did want to do it for all of you out there. It's essentially a free course. Um, and, uh, it's free, so you might as well just hit the like button, right? Subscribe if you do want to see more content like this. Make sure to share it with a friend as well. And yeah, I mean, look, we have a sending triangle top left. That's a breakout pattern. A descending triangle is one that is a bearish pattern. We have a falling wedge. We have, um, what else here? A rectangle, inverse head and shoulders, the head and shoulders. So these are all very much worth understanding even if you're not a short-term trader, just just understand these guys. It takes a little bit of work. It takes some time, but overall, it is well worth it. So that is a quick little rundown on technical analysis. So now let's talk about picking winning stocks, and then we'll talk about taxes in a couple of minutes before we do wrap up the video. And again, I do appreciate all of you guys for sticking all throughout this video. If you watch the whole thing, leave me a comment. I want to know how many of you guys watched the entire video. You probably didn't watch it in one sitting, but if you got to this point, drop me a comment down below. I do appreciate all of you for uh, taking the time to watch this video. And if you found value, I really hope you did. I mean, if you didn't find value, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but yeah, drop me a comment. So picking winning stocks. The most important thing when building out a portfolio of stocks is selecting stocks that you fully understand. You've heard about this before, right? Uh, or maybe not. I'm going to tell you now if you haven't. You want to invest in companies that you can really pitch to a five-year-old. So let's say, for example, you invest in Apple or Amazon or, um, you know, PayPal or something like that. You should be able to, in 15, 30 seconds, pitch to a five, 10-year-old what the business does, how they make money, and why they're a strong business with a competitive advantage. It's simple, right? Or, well, maybe it's not simple. Well, if it isn't simple, you shouldn't be investing in it, right? Because you have to fully understand it and be able to pitch it in, in 30 seconds in very simple terms. That is number one, right, when picking winning stocks. And if you don't do this, if you can't do this, you are going to be confused. You're not going to know what the business does. And if things turn for the worse, you're screwed. You don't, you, you're not going to know what to do. You know, if a business, if the stock price starts going down, you won't know whether or not it's a buying opportunity, whether or not you should sell it. So fully understanding a business is number one. That is the, the first thing that you need to do in order to pick a winning stock. So number two, you have to also be aware of valuation. Like we've talked about in this video, don't just go paying any dollar amount for stock just because um, it's your favorite stock. Don't do that. You have to go and pay a reasonable valuation for the stock. You have to pay a reasonable price for the stock. 
And that overall long term, believe it or not, guys, um, you probably probably realize this by now, maybe not, but the lower price you pay for a stock means the more returns you get long term if the stock pans out. Think about it. If you overpay for a stock, um, the, the chances of it going up more and more and more I mean, sure it can, but your future returns are going to be lower. But if you underpay for a solid company and you're holding for 5, 10, 20 years and it does well, your returns are more likely than not to be a lot higher. And when picking stocks, it's important to pick ones that have strong moats. We've talked about this throughout this entire video. A strong moat is a strong competitive advantage, whether it's a patent, whether it's a product that people use, let's say the Apple ecosystem. For example, if you have an iPhone, you most likely have an iWatch too that pairs to your iPhone. Look at my iWatch right here. And then you most likely have a uh, a set of AirPods which pair to your uh, you know your iPhone and your iWatch. So that is a very strong competitive advantage. Think about Google. They have the Google search engine, the number one search engine that people go to. It's a verb at this point. People say, oh, I'm Googling this, Googling that. You also have YouTube. Google owns YouTube, the second biggest search engine. So these are competitive advantages that you must spot before investing in in a business. A moat is, like I said, a specific competitive advantage, and that's one of the most important thing, if not the most important thing to look for when picking stocks. So let's move on here. Number two, slide number two. I personally like to focus on companies that have strong track records. A lot of these people out there, investors, traders, and quite frankly, more of the beginner traders out there, they're investing in penny stocks, um, you know, fly by night companies. Companies that don't have a track record and they think they're going to get rich overnight. More likely than not, they're going to lose all their money. And trust me, I've been that guy. When I first started investing, um, when was that? Eight years ago? I forget how long it's been at this point. It's been a while. I was the guy that's buying short term options. I was the guy that's buying leveraged ETFs. I was the guy that's buying, that was buying penny stocks. And let me tell you, it didn't work out well for me. So, <laughs> you know, now I focus on companies that have strong track records, proven success. They're not fly-by-night companies. They're not, for the most part, unprofitable. Sure, I do invest in some companies that are unprofitable, but they do have a road to profitability. So keep that in mind. If you do invest in companies that are unprofitable today, they better have a road to profitability over time. And if the company isn't profitable, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, again, because um, a lot of the time they have road uh, a road to profitability. So that's pretty reasonable there. And diversification is a good idea, but too much diversification might be detrimental. It could be. Um, at that point, you might as well invest in an ETF. You know, there's some people out there that own 100 individual stocks, 50 even. 50 is a lot, guys. Um, to keep track of 50 companies, that is pretty much a full-time job. I don't want to do that. Let me tell you, I don't want to do that. So if you're investing in 50 companies, 100 companies, that's just too much diversification. That might be detrimental to you. You might as well buy an ETF and set it and forget it and not worry about it. But let's say you have eight stocks, five stocks, um, three stocks, 12 stocks, 15 stocks. That is a reasonable amount. And it all depends on um, your risk tolerance. It's all relative to the person watching. You know, me personally, I probably have about 10, 15 holdings, you know, uh, five core holdings and, you know, about five, 10 other smaller positions around those holdings. So for me, yeah, 10, 15 is a good range. And if you want to shoot for larger returns, quite honestly, having fewer holdings being being more concentrated is your best bet. So let's say you want to beat the average 10% return for the market, which that that's what the average return is every year. Um, you might want to invest in three to five stocks, very concentrated, undervalued stocks that you bought at good prices. That gives you a better chance of beating the market over time. So let's talk about when to sell stocks. We've talked about when to buy, how to buy, you know, what brokerages to use and so forth. And the truth is 
Buying is the easy part. The hard part is deciding when to sell, deciding when to lock in gains or actually take a loss. So let's talk about it. Number one, the fundamentals of the company have drastically changed since when you first started investing in them and the vision is no longer the same. So if it's no longer the same, the company has has changed drastically since when you first started buying, that is a good sign to sell. So for example, let's say Apple, they uh, stopped they stopped selling iPhones and they started selling, um, I don't freaking know, something else like coffee mugs. I have a coffee mug right here I'm looking at. You know, let's say they completely changed their business. That would be a huge fundamental. That I mean, that's very drastic. That's not going to happen. But hypothetically, right, that would be a drastic change to the point where I would dump all my Apple stock right then and there. I would sell it all. So that's number one. Number two. Maybe you found another stock that is a better opportunity than the one that you're currently in. That happens all the time. So let's say you're uh, invested in Ford stock and then Tesla stock comes along. And I'm not saying Ford is better than Tesla. Tesla is better than Ford, but we're just using this as an example. Let's say five years ago you were invested in Ford and then you see Tesla making groundbreaking um, cars, you know, changing the industry. And you're, you're like, okay, I'm in Ford. I've made some money. It's time to sell out and, and, and invest in a more innovative company. That is an example of that. That is when you could sell a stock, sell a stock, and then you buy a, another company that you might think is at a better value, better future, and so forth. Another point here is in some cases, you can sell your stock at a loss to offset your capital gains for that current year. This will reduce your tax bill. And of course, I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. You guys must go talk to your accountant about this, but I'm telling you, I've used this strategy. Let's say one year in the stock market, you made $50,000. You made $50,000 profit. You sold your stocks. You made 50 grand. And let's say on one stock, you lost $10,000. $10,000. What you can do here is, okay, with 50,000 gain, um, you, you made 50 grand, you're going to have to pay taxes on that 50 grand. But let's say you lost $10,000 on this one stock, you can sell it at a $10,000 loss, you eat that loss, and that brings your taxable um, profit from 50,000 now to 40,000. So now you only pay taxes on $40,000 as opposed to $50,000. That is a very good way um, to reduce your tax bill and it's called tax loss harvesting. It's actually happening right when I'm filming this video. It's the end of the year and you're probably watching this. Well, you are watching this in the beginning of 2022 and that's what people do. They sell at a loss and they write it off against their gains. They pay less taxes. That's another reason why you should sell stocks. And the last reason here, and there's probably a lot more reasons, many more reasons, but we're only given a couple here on this video, guys. The last reason is it has reached your target price slash you believe it's overvalued. So let's say Tesla, for example, you bought it before all the splits. You bought it at a very low price and you... 100 extra money. I actually, maybe not 100 X, but let's say you 20 extra money. You made a crap ton of money. Now you think it's overvalued. It hits your price target. You might as well just sell it, or you might as well sell half of it, or take out your initial investment and play with house money. That is what you can do. And you can do that with any stock. You know, if your uh, Apple stock hit 250 bucks, you think it's too overvalued, you can sell out. Or if it hit your price target when you're running out numbers for five, 10 years away from now, you can sell it. That simple, guys. So now let's talk about everybody's favorite, taxes. Let's talk about some taxes. We have long-term capital gains and we have short-term capital gains. And these are the rates for 2022. So your filing status is important, whether you're single, head of household, married, filing jointly, married, filing separately. So 0% is what you will pay if you're single and you made up to $41,675. And you guys can see um, the rates here for, uh, or the dollar value for head of household, married, jointly, separately, whatever. 
and 15% rate is what you're going to pay. That's pretty standard here. Um, if you're making between 41.6 and 459,000 a year, and then 20%, and that's for single, by the way, and then 20% is what you're going to pay for any dollar amount you make over 459,000 and 750 dollars. Pretty simple, right? So long-term capital gains, they're pretty much 15, 20%, um, 0%, depending on how much you make. So that is that's pretty standard right now. That is what it's looking like. Pretty clear cut, simple, straight to the point. Now, the next slide here is short-term taxes. These are a little bit different. You know, if you're um oh, and by the way, I almost forgot. Jeez, guys, I can't believe I almost forgot one of the key points. Long-term capital gains are on stocks that you hold for over a year. Very important. Very, very important. So if I bought Apple stock on January 1st, 2022, and I sold it three years later, the money I'm going to be making on that is long-term capital gains tax. Pretty much anything over one year, anything over one year, you're going to be taxed long-term capital gains. But anything under a year, so if you're day trading, you're swing trading, you are going to be paying short-term capital gains. So if I bought a stock, held it for six months, I'm paying short-term capital gains. So short-term capital gains are taxed at the taxpayer's top marginal tax rate or regular income bracket, tax bracket, which can range from 10%, like you guys see right here, all the way up to 37%. Percent. So let's say, for example, you're single, you made up the 9950 bucks, you're paying 10%. Between 9950 to 4000 or 40000 rather, you're paying 12%. And the scale goes up all the way to 37%. So if you're making um, a quarter million dollars a year short-term capital gains, you're paying 35%. And anything over 523000 you're going to be paying um, over 500 or uh, rather 37%. I believe, oh, I'm, I'm looking at this chart now. This is, uh, or rather, these are the rates for 2021. So understand, there is an incentive to hold stocks long term. There really is. There really is an incentive. And the incentive is you're going to be paying less taxes. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do short term trading um, because, I mean, the, the taxes aren't that much higher. Yes, they are higher. But if you're making money, what is a 5 10% tax rate difference? I mean, in the short term, you're still making money, right? You're going to have to pay a little bit more taxes, but hey, I think it's worth it. You know, I, I've been doing this for a while. I pay short-term capital gains tax, and uh, I think it's worth it. You know, I'm making money. I think it's worth it, right? If you're paying taxes, that means you're making money. So pause this, screenshot this, take a look at the rates. And with that being said, guys, let's move on to the closing thoughts. And again, if you watch all three out this video you're awesome you're, you're a champion i mean you're, you're gonna do well um i really do appreciate all of you guys out there make sure to drop me a comment don't forget to hit the like button subscribe and check out the different links down below you know you can get some free stocks from webull get some free money from m1 finance you can join my patreon if you want where i post all my buys sells call outs i post all my morning videos on there morning update videos you get more access to me throughout the day with any questions you have check out my patreon if if you guys want, it's linked down below, or you can go to stasurfest.com slash Patreon. That's stasurfest.com slash Patreon. So closing thoughts, let's talk a little bit. What you guys have to understand is if I can leave you with anything here, it's to find a strategy that works for you and stick to it, whether it's selling call options, whether it's, and you can do different strategies, but find what works for you and just stick to it. Forget what the media is telling you. Forget the next hot sector, you know, the next hot stock. Forget all that. If your strategy is buying an ETF every month religiously, buying it, setting it, and forgetting it, that's all you got to do. Boom. That That's simple. Buy or uh, do what works for you and stick to it. If you're a day trader, it works for you. You're doing well. Stick to it. If you're a swing trader, stick to it. That's number one. Number two, don't be afraid to experiment with different strategies. This is so important, especially if you're a beginner. Get your feet wet. Know what works for you. Know what doesn't work. Let me tell you, I did this. I have paid, and I like to call this stock market tuition. You, your, uh, your losses in the stock market, they can be viewed as 
tuition. And trust me, I have lost a lot of money by doing short-term options, by playing leveraged ETFs, by buying penny stocks. I don't want to I don't want to even think about the exact dollar value, but it's uh it's definitely north of 20 grand that I've lost in my trading career, stock market career, probably close to 30 grand. And uh, that is, it's well worth it. It's well worth it because now I've recouped that money over the years and some, trust me guys, and some, right? So don't be afraid to experiment with different strategies, try things out, lose money. Don't be afraid to lose money and then figure out what works for you. And another thing worth mentioning here, time in the market beats timing the market. What that means essentially is the longer you're in the market, the better. Trying to time the bottom, trying to time the crash, that's not a winning strategy. If you want to be a long-term investor, buy, hold, you're going to make money long-term. And there's a stat out there. Uh, I forget exactly what it is. Maybe you guys can chime in in the comments. A stat says that if you missed the, the best 20 trading days in the history of the market or something like that, your gains would be a lot lower than those people that were invested through those 20 best trading days. So keep that in mind. If you simply buy and hold long term, you're going to be good. And most people, truth is, most people are better off buying ETFs and holding for the long term as opposed to trying to, uh, to pick stocks and beat the market. There's a lot of people that think they're the next Warren Buffett because they had one very good investment. The truth is, long term, it's very difficult to pick stocks and beat the market. So simply buy ETFs and just do that for the long term or have a bulk of your money in ETFs and then play with individual stocks with, let's say, 20, 30 percent of your money or your overall um, stock market money. Right. And in my opinion, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, you have to be very hands on and dedicated to even have a chance at beating the market. You often have to think outside of the box as well. And by that, I mean, you have to read the annual reports of companies, dive into the financials. You have to be on on top of these companies, listen to earnings calls, which a lot of people aren't willing to do that. And if you're not willing to do that, you're probably not going to beat the market. Let's be honest. So you have to be very hands-on, very dedicated to even have a chance of beating the market. And the key to beating the market is to obviously outperform in bull markets. This is what people don't understand, guys. A lot of uh, fund managers um, do very well in bull markets, but they get obliterated in bear markets to the point where their average return after a bull market and a bear market, uh, a full cycle, their average return is a lot less than the overall market's return. So the key thing here is, I can't say this enough, beat the market or at least keep up with the market during a bull market and then don't get destroyed in a bear market. So let's say, for example, um, during a year of a bull market, you, your, uh, your portfolio is up 20%, S&P's up 20%. And then the next year we have a bear market, S&P goes down 10% and you only go down 5%. That is you outpacing the market um, over those two years, if that makes any sense, guys. So overall, that's pretty much it. This video is ridiculously long, but I hope you guys did find value in it. I put a lot of work. This took me um, about a week or two of planning out the slides and how I want to format them. And then it took me about three to four days of filming, um, you know, a couple hours a day, about an hour or two a day of filming. So yeah, I put a lot of work into it. If you guys found value, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, drop me a comment. Let me know your thoughts. And especially if you guys stuck till the end, drop me a comment and let me know and feel free to share this with a friend. It's essentially a free course. Like I said, many times throughout this video, and don't forget to also get your free money down below. There's a Webull link. You could get free stocks from Webull. You can get some money from M1 finance and you could get some money from Coinbase. All of that is linked down below. You might as well use those links and kickstart your stock market journey with some free money. Don't forget to check out my Patreon as well. If you guys want all all my real-time buys, sells, call-outs, morning update videos. If you want more access to me throughout the day, I'm literally posting all my moves there from trades to options to long-term investments, and you get more access to me throughout the day, like I said, plus morning videos. So check it out. Link down below, or you guys can go to StarSurfFest.com slash Patreon. That's StarSurfFest.com slash Patreon. And with that being said, guys, cheers to a solid 
happy, healthy, wealthy 2022. Cheers to that. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Good luck this year. And if you're watching this after 2022, this applies for years to come, guys. So enjoy the video. Again, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.